Today, uh, we're coming to you from Malakadi country in southern Tasmania. And uh, yeah, I just want to acknowledge the traditional people of this land. They've been practicing agriculture uh, for tens of thousands of years and looking after this country and uh, the beautiful abundance that I can see out th that window there all kind of comes to us partly from the, the management of this country for a very long time. Um, today, we're going to be talking about waste-free mushroom cultivation and wild fungi foraging. Um, so if you've got any questions, uh, whack at them in the, the comments there, and I'll, uh, I'll try to get to any that you ask within the comments. Um, if you haven't already, make sure, and especially if you're watching this as a delay, um, then make sure you check out the blog post on milkwood.net uh, that we published earlier in the week, uh, or last week, actually, uh, no, on Monday. Um, and it has a detailed video on how to do a lot of these processes, how to go wild foraging, and um, also uh, it has a, a great download sheet, worksheet, or, so you can follow the steps step by step and you don't miss anything. Um, so make sure you check that out. Um, we've been doing waste-free mushroom cultivation for about six years now, um, six or seven years. And it's really something that we've developed and evolved uh, since we started doing mushroom cultivation. When we were first introduced to these ideas, it was very much um, the use of single-use plastics was dominant um, and still is in commercial cultivation. And most of the information that you find on the internet is really about how to use these polypropylene bags, uh, which are single-use and throw away. And uh, we don't think that that aligns very well with permaculture ethics um, of, of earth care and people care of or fair share. So we wanted to learn how to do mushroom cultivation in a way which uh, didn't destroy the planet. So a lot of the techniques that we've uh, learnt and developed and, and picked up off other people are about reusing um, materials and reusing recycled materials uh, over and over again uh, to reduce the, the use of throwaway uh, plastic resources. Um, hi, Sandra. Hi, Brenda. Hi, Kate. Show us the mushrooms. <laughs> we'll get to that. I've got a few down here that I can, I can show you later on in the stream. Um, hi, Marianne, um, and uh, already we've got some questions from Brittany um, who wants to know about subtropics. Hi, we'll get there in a the middle. And a little bit from Kate from Southeast Queensland. We'll get there in a minute as well. Um, yeah, so first thing first, make sure you check out the blog post um, on milkwood.net, uh, the step-by-step -step instructions on there, the video on there. There's heaps of information and a whole bunch of useful links as well. Um, yeah, so I'll I'll start with a couple of questions here, and then I'll jump to uh, ones that we've we've people have already submitted on the blog, um, on the on Facebook and on Instagram. Um, if you if there are any questions that I don't get to today, make sure um, that you do uh, answer, ask those questions.
How are we doing now? We have audio. I'm not sure what happened with that. We're back on, I think. Sorry about that. Um, not sure what the story was there, but audio is good now. Thanks, Nicole. <clears throat> Weird not, weirdness. Okay. Uh, growing the subtropics. Choose your species is the first thing. Um, so there's a bunch of different um, uh, mushrooms which grow better or fungi which grow better in the subtropics and the tropics. The number one for the tropics is the paddy straw mushroom. I'd go for those. Um, and then most of the oyster mushrooms will do quite well, especially the uh, golden and the pink oyster mushrooms. And uh, then medicinals like reishi love the heat. Um, and lion's mane too. They do really quite well in the heat. So that would be my top tips for growing in uh, the the subtropics. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was the, the, the first question. Anyone else got a question in the chat there? Hi, Deborah from the Macedon Ranges and hi, Kathy from South Australia. Um, so Lara says, or Laura, says that um, living in Los Angeles and having trouble with dry weather and uh, the humidity being a problem. Um, is a water spritzer, a little spray bottle, is that going to be enough to keep the humidity up in that sort of dry climate? Yeah, that, that can be a real challenge and it's probably the number one challenge that people have is keeping the humidity up. So uh, when you start to commit a little bit more, uh, in that video, we showed you a way to get started, you know, to get a little bit of a yield. Once you get a bit more committed to it, um, I would encourage people to create a, a more humid microclimate. Now, that might be somewhere that already exists at, at your place. You might have a, a little frog pond out the front with a tree fern or something that is already humid. Or if you're in a really dry climate, then you're probably going to have to enclose your mushroom fruiting area. We call that a fruiting chamber. Um, and there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Probably the easiest way using something that's off the shelf is with a mini greenhouse, one of those cheap um, mini greenhouses or creating something like a mini greenhouse. Don't put it in the full sun though. Uh, put it somewhere in the shade and um, then uh, you can either just mist inside that or you can add an ultrasonic mister or even um, there's there's a couple of different types of cool mist misters. And if you want to, you can even invest for $30 or $40 in a humidity controller, which will turn that humidifier on and off. But that requires you to run power to that system. And, you know, you're going to spend $50, $100 to, to set that up. So it's a little bit more um, serious. Yeah, Kane, you, you know that the plastics uh, comes up over and over again. Um, and and we do really try to get rid of it as much as possible. Um, yeah. Uh, a question here from Clara. Have you had any luck with growing lion's manes in a bucket? Okay, lion's mane mushroom, one of the most beautiful mushrooms that grow, and I've actually got some growing here. So people, someone was asking before about the mushrooms. So this is lion's mane or hericium erinaceus um and here we've got it growing in in a mason jar um so this mason jar has got down the center of the jar um if that's in focus um there is a core of of grain now and that grain was then inoculated through the lid through a little silicon port in the top um, to inoculate with liquid culture of lion's mane. So this is sort of next level stuff. Um, we've got sterile grain in a glass jar. This was sterilized grain and sawdust in a glass jar. This was sterilized in a pressure cooker. Um, and then we're using syringes and uh, liquid culture to inoculate that. Now, this is waste-free mushroom cultivation, but it does require a little bit more knowledge. I'm going to open this up and show you what lion's mane looks like when it's fruiting. This is just starting to fruit, and it'll fruit out the lid there. But check that out. Isn't that beautiful? It's an amazing, amazing mushroom. Um, medicinal and tasty as. It helps repair the myelin sheath around nerve cells um, in 
in both the brain and in the rest of the body. Um, it's a nootropic um, mushroom, um, which is fantastic for your brain, and it tastes great as well. Been eaten for by for thousands of years, um, so it's well uh, trusted and well known um, and and safe and safe to eat. Now, as far as growing them in buckets go, yes, you can grow them in the same buckets that you do the other one, but generally speaking, um, they do much better on an enriched sterile substrate. So that involves using a pressure cooker and sterilizing the buckets. Those polypropylene plastic buckets can be sterilized, um, but generally speaking, when we're first starting, stick to the oyster mushrooms. Um, they're more reliable and more productive, and you don't need to um, sterilize the substrates, you can pasteurize the substrate. So we spell that out in the video. Pasteurizing is not killing everything. It's just killing most things that are in the, in the substrate, in the straw or the sawdust. And it is, uh, is reducing the competition, but it's leaving behind some of these amazing thermotolerant organisms, which help actually reduce contamination. They're kind of like beneficial microorganisms. All right, got lots of questions coming through in the in the chat, but I do want to get to the ones um, that are uh, that people have submitted beforehand because they got in first. So I'll get some of them out of the way. So Rachel um, on Facebook, she asked, "What happens when once your your bucket of of substrate has fruited? Uh, do you just compost the leftover material? And how do you make more grain spawn to begin the process again?" Can you just use some of the material from your last bucket? Well, you can, all right? You can take um, the mycelial, the, my, the, the colonized straw or sawdust from your last batch, and you could use that to inoculate more pasteurized straw and sawdust. There is a couple of issues with it though. Firstly, that process, because that mycelium and straw and sawdust has been out in an exposed environment. It's likely to have more mold on it, um, mold spores and other fungal spores and bacterial uh, contamination as well. So if you use it to inoculate fresh substrate, there's a good chance that you will get more contamination. The other issue is when we inoculate with grain spawn, we're bringing not just the mycelium across, but we're also bringing all the nutrients that are in the grain. There's all the sugars and the proteins and all kinds of um, um, vitamins and minerals that are in the grain. Grain is very nutritious. Uh, and we're bringing that into our freshly prepared substrate from a sterile environment, apart from the fungi that we're trying to grow. It's otherwise sterile. So we're introducing that, but it's fully colonized. So other contaminants can't get a foothold because the mycelium is growing strongly in that grain. So it's a way of adding nutrient as well as an inoculant. Now, people often ask then, why can't I just add some new grain mixed in with my straw and sawdust and inoculate with some old mycelium? Well, the problem is that new grain that you're adding is not sterile. And the new, the environment that you're adding it into is not perfectly sterile. And the grain is really easy for bacteria or mold to colonize. So typically you can't just add sterile grain to your pasteurized substrate. You will get contamination. So that's why we use fully colonized grain spawn to inoculate our pasteurized straw and sawdust. So you can use that spent substrate but you, your success rate will be much, much lower and the amount of fruit that you get will be lower because there's much less nutrient in there. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the other part of that question that Rachel had was how, how do you make more grain spawn to begin the process again? Um, so here is uh, some grain spawn. This is how we make grain spawn. This is enoki, uh, enokitaki. And you can see the mycelium when that comes into focus. Got to hide my head. You can see the mycelium, the white mycelium down here, whoop, down there, growing on the, the wheat grain that we've got in this jar. So this wheat has been sterilized in a pressure cooker. And uh, at first it was moisturized. It had moisture added to it to the right amount. And then it was sterilized in a pressure cooker. Then after it had cooled down, uh, we used a liquid culture syringe to inoculate through this little um, this little silicon port 
and it grew through there. And now it's just about ready to use to inoculate um, either a bucket of pasteurized substrate or a container of uh, sterilized substrate like that glass jar that the lion's mane was done with. Um, so that's how we make grain spawn. Again, it's a slightly more involved process. Um, uh, we do have, I believe, some instructions on the, our, our website on how to do this. And these more complicated processes, we are actually in the mo at the moment producing a new online course about mushroom cultivation that covers all of this in a lot, lot more detail. Um, there, there is a bit to it. It's totally something that's doable by a home cultivator. If you've um, got a little bit of passion, a little bit of time, you do not need a complex, expensive lab. This system uses these, um, these special airport lids that we teach you how to make, um, and it does everything in the sterile environment of the jar, which is really handy. It saves you a lot of time and effort. Okay. Um, as far as that part about uh, what do you do once your bucket has fruited, you'll often get a, a second flush of mushrooms, which will come a week or two after you've harvested the first flush. Um, so... That's the first thing. You can get multiple flushes. Uh, you could sometimes get three or even four flushes. Indeed, here's a bucket that uh, I've got here um, with some mushrooms growing out of it. But this, you'll notice these mushrooms aren't that impressive. And the reason they're not that impressive is because this is a, uh, a third flush. So these ones have, have already fruited a few times. So there's much less in the way of nutrient. And they're basically almost not worth doing. So often I find that we do um, a first flush, um, maybe a second flush, and then we just compost the entire remaining material. Um, you can bury it in the ground and sometimes that'll, in your garden, and sometimes that'll give you another flush as well. Um, yeah, but it makes fantastic compost as well. Uh, all right, here's a question. So that was, Melanie, you had that same question as well about the spent substrate. Um, a question from Kane. Uh, isn't Hericium erinaceus a bit tricky as it's considered a bio-risk that, that probably shouldn't be here in Australia? And should we be growing a local Hericium? Good point. Um, this is not actually Hericium erinaceus. It's the, uh, the Hericium that uh, Aussie Mushroom Supplies is selling, um, which is a, a local Hericium coralloid. Cor Coralloides, uh, coral-like, um, uh, that's growing in Australia. I, I'm just always refer to Hericium arenaceus because that's worldwide. That's the lion's mane, which is most commonly grown. So you're absolutely right, Kane. Um, in Australia, it is uh, not legal to import Hericium arenaceus, it's, uh, but it's perfectly fine to grow Hericium uh, coralloides. As far as... Um, the legalities of growing Hericium erinaceus. I don't believe there's any law against growing it, but we should be definitely cautious um, with it because uh, someone at some point has flagged that it's a potential uh, uh, safety risk for our indigenous plants and animals. So um, good point. Uh, Melanie, we've got that one. Uh, ooh, here's a great question from Shobi. Um, how do we encourage a bluet patch in leaflet in the garden to pin? Mycelium is growing very well, smelling very mushroomy. Okay, so um, once we start growing in, in patches in the garden, especially the, uh, the mushrooms like Kingstropharia, bluets, or even morels, uh, then we're kind of a little bit more a at the mercy of the environment around us, the humidity and the temperature, but also of all the other symbiotic microorganisms that are living in your garden. Uh, so what I've found is I haven't had that much experience doing bluet patches, um, but uh, definitely with King Strafaria, often they do well when they get a, a nice big dose of microbial stimulus. The easiest way to do that is to get some really good quality compost, uh, preferably something that you've made yourself, and uh, just 
remove that little layer of, um, of loose leaf mold on the top or leaf litter on the top and spread out that layer of compost and water it in. And often that massive hit of sort of biological competition can be enough to stimulate your, your bluets or your kingstropharia um, into fruiting. Um, so that would be my, my number one tip. Other one, keep it well watered over the summer so that this time of year when bluets are starting to, to fruit all around uh, southern Australia, um, then um, that's when uh, they're going to come out if they've had good water in the, in the season beforehand. And every season, top dress it with some more uh, organic material, leaf litter, um, you can use compost um, or even straw or wood chips will eventually break down and, and give it some extra extra food yeah okay let's get back to the questions that were pre-asked sarah is keen to get started growing mushrooms but a couple of things are holding um, them back uh, the main one is getting builder's lime where can you get builder's lime whenever um, they go to the hardware store to get builder's lime it's in these giant 20 kilo you know 45 pound bags of of this material that you're never going to use up um, it's not that expensive, but do you really want to be having a huge container of this? Um, uh, you know, it's it's not a toxic material, but it is dangerous. You don't want to get it in your eyes. You don't want to breathe it in. You don't want a bag of it falling over in your garage. It's going to make a mess. Um, so my, my best tip for that is some places do sell it by the kilo, um, especially feed supply, supply places uh, sometimes sell it by the kilo um, or by the pound. Uh, the other way is you can buy it on eBay. eBay, yeah. Uh, people, um, I believe, buy great big bags of builder's lime, hydrated lime, and then bag it up in Ziploc bags and, and ship it to you. So that's a cheap way of getting a small amount. As far as using lime, um, in the pasteurization method we teach in the video, I don't think we, we don't actually show you um, using hydrated lime, but you can always add a small amount to just about any substrate, any recipe. Um, it's going to shift the pH up, and that's going to make it less likely to get contamination from a bunch of different microorganisms. So the heat pasteurization method does not need you to use hydrated lime. So you can get a good job, get a good, good um, success without it. Um, but if you do want to, or you do have it available, um, often it's something that I include in a recipe just to get a little bit better success rate. Uh, what else have we got here? Got a question here from Kane. Uh, yeah, uh, just that point about rhizobacterium, yeasts and bacteria forming relationships with other soil microorganisms. Excellent. Okay. Uh, another question from Sarah was, trying to boil enough water to cover the substrate and carry it to my work area. Any tips on doing that safely? So first thing, be really careful carrying containers full of, of hot water. Um, 80 degree water is easily hot enough to give you a very nasty burn. So I wouldn't recommend that. I encourage people to uh, pasteurize in the container in the location that they're, um, that they're heating the water. So whether that be a big pot on a stovetop or on a gas ring or on, over a campfire in the backyard or even better over a rocket stove or even better over a biochar kiln, um, don't move the water. Once it's hot, pasteurize your substrate in the hot water over the top of the heat source. That's the easiest way. The other thing I would recommend, if you are going to, one technique that I've used quite successfully is to uh, pasteurize, uh, use the hot water and supply that hot water into an esky, a, a chili bin if you're a New Zealander, a cooler if you're in the United States, a big insulated container. You put your substrate in a bag in one of those brewer's bags or in a, a pillowcase in the the esky, in the cooler, and then um, you tap off the water into the, um, the container and cover it with 75, 80 degree water, seal the, the lid of the, the, the cooler, and you'll find that that'll easily stay warm for hours. You only need to do it for an hour, um, and by the end of that hour, um, with the fact that the, the substrate was probably already a lot colder, the temperature in there will still be above 60 degrees Celsius, which is that point that we need it to be to ensure successful pasteurization. Don't move the water uh, if you can help it. Instead, pipe it uh, using a tap off the bottom of uh, either a 
hot water service that is um, a lot of solar hot water services, the laundry tap will be well above uh, 60 degrees Celsius. Um, otherwise, you can use a Fowler's for cola unit and like a pasteurizing unit for um, for heat um, pasteurization of things like Posada and the like. Those units could be used. You can get a submersible element, electric element too. That could go straight into your... Um, your Esky or your cooler, uh, and they're really cheap on eBay, like $30, $40, uh, really very easy to do that. Okay, uh, another question from the list. Raya, Raya um, it has asked, I have two questions. Could you boil your substrate instead of keeping it at a certain temperature in order to pasteurize it? Um, and could you use Ziploc freezer bags to incubate the inoculated substrate okay you could use ziploc freezer bags but then we're back into the same problem of, of single-use plastic lightweight plastic containers are not going to survive multiple uses without getting holes in them and making them impossible to clean the good thing about those uh pet um or oh, sorry polypropylene plastic food grade buckets this one you know had feta in it um is that they're free to get um they are bomb proof they really last a very long time can't quite make it out on the bottom there, but this says on the bottom, you can see it says number five and polypropylene, five PP. Um, so not five is the recycled symbol for polypropylene and PP means polypropylene. Those things are bomb-proof. They can go in a pressure cooker. They can handle 140 odd degrees Celsius before they start to distort. Um, and we can reuse them over and over again. So don't use Ziploc bags if you can avoid it. If you're just trying it once, yeah, okay, use a recycled Ziploc bag, um, but I would prefer to use hard plastic containers. The other part about that is, could you boil your substrate instead of keeping it at a certain temperature? I use just a meat thermometer or a cheese making thermometer and stick it in the top of the pot or the container to keep it between 60 and 80 degrees Celsius. Sorry, American friends, you'll have to do the calculation to work out what that is, because I can never do that in my head. But between 60 degrees Celsius and 80 degrees Celsius. You can't boil because then you kill those thermotolerant organisms and you will get more contamination. They're in there helping us. So there's a sweet spot, a Goldilocks zone between 60 and 80 uh, degrees. Jane, don't worry that you just tuned in. Um, it's going to be on YouTube later. It's going to be on Facebook later. Um, you can catch it up to it as long as you like. Yay. Uh, all right. Next question. Um, someone whose name I can't pronounce. G-M-U-A-C-C-A-D. Can you start a bucket from an inoculated bag? We kind of already covered that. How about the first, after the first harvest? We can reuse it over, uh, we can get a couple of second flushes. Um, does the mycelium take over in the new substrate or will it be too weak? The mycelium probably will take over, but it just won't have enough food to fruit prolifically. You'll get something like this result and you'll go, wow, that was a lot of effort for not very many mushrooms. You should be getting clusters like this off a of first flush that was inoculated with grain. And when they're done, that's another nice thing about this technique. These little holes that they're growing out of, you can just twist off the whole lot um, and get a big, great big cluster of mushrooms um, off there without even having to cut or or taking anything with you. Um, got a question from Salamo57 on Instagram. Um, any thoughts on why my Kingstropharia are growing all around the sides of my big forest bed and none in the middle? Definitely wood chip fully infiltrated with mycelium and then compost casing. I'm posting video after this comment. Oh, cool. Um, I'll check out that video, Salamo, um, on on your Instagram. Um, but I'm guessing what it is is a combination of, of two possible things. One is that there was an initial inoculation point and the mycelium is growing out from there. Often when the mycelium has an a, a unlimited amount of food and it's got no competition, it just goes, wow. I better colonize all the space I can and it'll grow out and grow out, rushing out as far as it can to gather as much resources as possible. Then it hits some sort of barrier. Either it runs out of food, um, it's like at the edge of the wood chip, or it runs into some competition and it goes, ah, better fruit. I, bet, I might be at 
uh, at risk of dying here, I better make some babies. I better produce some mushrooms to make spores, to spread them out into the world so that my genes can continue off into the world and, and uh, my species can continue to live. So um, what might be happening is it might be just that natural, it's growing out from the middle and it's it's recognised that it's hit the end of its, um, its available space so it needs to fruit. It could be that in the middle there, there's already a whole bunch of critters attacking and, and weakening um, the, the uh, mycelium in that spot. So it's stronger out of the sides. So that might be why it's going. Because some, some critters take a while to catch on that there's a whole bunch of, of food here. Um, and, uh, you know, once they do, uh, slaters and all kinds of, you know, roly polies and all kinds of little beetles um, can be getting in there and eating that mycelium, weakening it. So that might be a reason. And finally, it might just be better conditions around the edges. Um, you know, the edges is where the action is a lot of the time. It's often that combination of light and air circulation that's out there at the side um, and maybe better humidity. Um, maybe it's the light. Um, mushrooms respond to light. They respond to uh, increased airflow and they respond to increased humidity. They're the three things or the three main things which will trigger, trigger fruiting. So it might be just too dark there in the middle of that patch. Um, and that's why they're not fruiting. It's kind of a fallacy that mushrooms don't like light. They just don't like extreme heat and they don't like very low humidity. And often that comes with bright light from the sun. So it's not that they dislike the light, it's that they dislike the heat and they dislike the dryness. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think uh, Kirsten you know, or maybe it's Heather in the background is answering a few questions on there. Um, as well. So uh, Saffron, I think they got your question there. Um, Lizzie has a question from Instagram, Lizzie Crouch. Uh, and Lizzie says, um, I'm wanting to have a play with shiitake logs. Why wouldn't you want to have a play with shiitake logs, Lizzie? Um, I can't seem to find anywhere about the best time um, such month of the year to inoculate. And she's loving our book. Thank thanks, uh, Lizzie. Um, okay. So shiitake logs, there's a couple of different things that would determine when you should inoculate those logs. One is the climate that you're in, Goldilocks zone. You don't want to be inoculating, you know, putting these small pieces of mycelium out into the wild um, in the middle of winter if it's freezing cold. And you don't want to be doing that in the middle of summer if it's hot and dry. So Typically, you're going to be inoculating in the spring or in the in the autumn, in the fall, because those parts of the year, those shoulder seasons, are um, the most um, conducive to the mycelium thriving once it hits that that uh, that timber in the log. Uh, now, of course, if you're if in your environment it's beautiful and moderate in the middle of winter um, and really hot. In the middle of summer and in spring and autumn then inoculating in winter would be better if you're in a really cold environment uh, where it's wet and humid in the middle of summer it might be better better to inoculate in the middle of summer so your temperature is going to adjust things as well there's one thing the second thing is typically we want to inoculate almost fresh logs now a lot of people will tell you that those logs should sit for a period of time uh, before you inoculate, and they're right, there are these antifungal compounds that trees use to defend themselves from fungal attack. And by waiting a little while for them to dissipate, you'll get higher success rate. But if you're anything like me and you're forgetful, you chop down a whole bunch of um, logs and you put them somewhere to, uh, to rest before inoculating, and you forget about them and they dry out and things get busy and kids need looking after and and housework needs being done and all the things around the garden need to get done and you forget about them and then it's like three months later and the logs have really dried out. That's not good either. So unless it's something that's got a lot of antifungal properties, I typically inoculate pretty well straight after, after, um, after felling of the live branches and live tree. Other than that, as far as times of year go, if you want to get really good, you know, professional growers will typically inoculate their logs if they're growing shiitake on oak or something else from the Fagaceae family, you know, uh, beech or, um, or chestnut, then 
Um, they're going to be uh, harvesting those logs. When you see the leaves in autumn on the tree, about 25% orange. So while well, they're still mostly green, but they've started to suck the sugars down from the leaves into the trunk and into the mass of the tree. At that point, the tree has the maximum sugar load in the um, in the in the wood and the maximum potential uh, to fruit from. Um, yeah, so that's when I would recommend if you really want to be perfect, but otherwise, it it should be fine. Spring, autumn, any time when the weather's quite nice. Um, yeah. Uh, if you've got any other questions about shiitake log cultivation, ask those questions on the blog post and, and I'll get in there and answer them later as well. Um, Rachel has a question. Where do you rec recommend purchasing spores to get started? That was on Facebook. Um, I wouldn't recommend spores to get started. A um, little bit on language. Spores are the, the tiny little microscopic um, they're like sperm and egg of, of fungi um, that the, the mushroom releases. And growing from spores is, is more challenging. It's hard to collect the spores in a way where contaminants don't get in. And because you've got such a tiny amount of mycelium when they germinate and, and then uh, breed, um, the volume is so low that um, it's very prone to contamination. So uh, rather than use spores, S-P-O-R-E, I would use spawn, S-P-A-W-N. And in that case, you're inoculating with strong, healthy mycelium. The easiest place to start is by buying yourself some grain spawn like this. Unfortunately, it'll probably come in single-use plastic. Um, and using that to inoculate your bulk substrate, which you've prepared probably through pasteurization or maybe lime pasteurization, heat pasteurization or lime pasteurization. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Kane. Spores are difficult. It takes a couple of months working across agar plates to get good cultures. Uh, you know, Kane has had a lot of experience and um, he knows that, uh, and he does lab work. Um, so uh, I wouldn't recommend um, uh, trying that when you're just beginning. It's a, a more advanced technique that, that can yield amazing results and new varieties and all kinds of cool stuff. It's like breeding uh, chickens or tomatoes or something and getting new ones. And it's really valuable but it's not something that people who are just starting um, are likely to start off. Uh, awesome. Well, I think we're just about out of time. It's supposed to go for half an hour and we've gone for a bit, bit longer. Um, I just want to reiterate that if you haven't had a chance to check out the blog post on milkwood.net, that's where most of the information is written down. Most of these questions are, um, are answered by watching that video um, that's on there, that's on YouTube as well. Um, and um, by reading the blog post and downloading the, the little fact sheet that you can get, which step-by-step -step instructions. Um, now, Kane's made himself a new strain of shiitake. Good on you. Um, a good question there about uh, coffee grounds. Yeah, uh, coffee grounds fresh from the local cafe as a substrate. That works. Um, it's usually easy to get hold of, uh, particularly good for pink oyster mushrooms, Pleurotus Jamor or de Jamor, D J A O A M O R, uh, the pink oyster mushroom. They they grow so quickly, the mycelium. It races through those coffee grounds and colonizes it before there's a chance for contamination to occur. And that's the key with coffee grounds. Coffee grounds are much richer than straw or sawdust, and even though after they've been through a coffee machine. Um, they are more likely to encourage contamination. So I wouldn't recommend adding them more than about 20% by volume with your straw and your sawdust for other, other oyster mushroom varieties. And if you do, make sure that, that those coffee grounds are fresh from, um, from the coffee machine. Don't let them sit there uh, for a couple of days because they will get contaminated. Um, yeah, there are great spawn suppliers um, in Australia particularly got to give a shout out to Aussie Mushroom Supplies. Um, they're the largest and most professional, I think, in Australia, and they're very reliable. And the quality of their um, their spawn is fantastic. Um, it's a great place to start. Um, by all means, if you get into it and get excited, you know, make your own grain spawn, learn to do liquid culture, 
um, learn to use a pressure cooker to um, sterilize your substrates. But when you're first starting, uh, buy the spawn from a reputable supplier. Oh, great. Kane's willing to help out. So he's there. Send him a PM. Um, he's on Facebook, uh, in the Facebook comments. So send a PM to Kane and he can um, help you out with liquid cultures or spawn as well. Good on you, Kane. Awesome. All right. Well, I think that's just about wraps up for the day. Like I said, um, check out the blog post. Down the bottom of the blog post, um, uh, there is uh, information there about signing up for the wait list for our mushroom cultivation course, which will be coming out in a couple of months' time. Um, uh, and that's, you know, that all that does is gives us your email. We won't use that for any marketing other than sending you out information about the mushroom cultivation course. Um, there's also the actual video on the blog post comes from our permaculture living course, which covers a huge range of different topics um, with, with David Holmgren um, leading that. Uh, and um, that actually reopens... Um, for a short period next week. So next Monday, the Permaculture Living course starts up um, again. And that's just one of 40, more than 40 videos that are in the Permaculture Living course with a vast amount of resources after each video um, to get you living like it matters, uh, taking up really positive habits that will help your family and your community, help you get healthier um, and uh, help you live more self-sufficiently at your place. So uh, check that out if you're interested. Um, there's a bunch of information on our website about that course as well. Um, thank you for joining us. And um, we'll see you all again in a few weeks' time when we do another one of these. See ya.